let me start by introducing you. Okay, I'm not going to go through a long introduction, Robert, because you're you're so famous, people already know who you are. But anyway, uh, I'm Andrew Natsios, the director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs at the Bush School of Government at Texas A&M University. And I'd like to welcome you this evening to our program, where we will be talking with Robert Kaplan about his new book, The Good American, A Life of Bob Gersoni. Uh, let me introduce Mr. Kaplan. Uh, we're honored to have you, and I don't say that to every person who speaks at the Bush School. Uh, you, we are, we're going to have uh, Sir Paul Collier speak on February 22nd. Interestingly enough, he writes in the same subjects, Robert, that you do on failed and fragile states. Our guest lecturer tonight, Robert Kaplan, is the best-selling author of 19 books on foreign affairs and travel translated into many languages, The Coming Anarchy, The Balkan Ghosts, Asia's Cauldron, Monsoon, The Revenge of Geography. His most recent book, The Good American, is what we'll be discussing this evening. He holds the Robert Strauss Hoopy Chair in Geopolitics at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. For three decades, he reported on foreign affairs for the Atlantic. Uh, I do want to say that uh, Thomas Friedman identified the four most influential thinkers and writers about the shape of the post-Cold War world. And he identified uh, uh, Robert as one of those, along with Sam Huntington, Paul Kennedy, and Frank Fukuyama, all of whom are academics. Robert's the one who is not, who got his knowledge from the ground using similar methodologies, I might add, to Bob Grissoni's, which is why both you and I are probably attracted to him so much. But I, I, I wanna start by thanking you for endorsing the book that we just published through uh, Roman Littlefield called Transforming Our World, which is a set of 17 essays on the foreign policy of George H.W. Bush by the people who actually ran, the, Jim Baker wrote a chapter, uh, Condi Rice, Carla Hills, uh, Richard Haas, myself, Dave Maxwell, who was my deputy at OFDA 30 years ago, uh, and a number of other people. And thank you, Robert, for doing that. We put your endorsement first because it was the most appointed. Um, I also want to say just for me, I, I couldn't put the book down because so many of the people in that book are were part of my life too, uh, in, in a different way. Uh, and uh, we all connected with, in different ways, with, with Bob Grissoni over the years. So Janet Ballantyne, who sort of adopted Bob, was my acting deputy at AID until, until Fred Sheck, also prominently in the book, uh, became the permanent con Senate confirmed deputy head of, of uh, AID. And then Roger Winter uh, was the head of OFDA. And Fred Cuny was another one of the historic figures in and friends and, and who work with us. Um, there are a few books that have been written about the good the United States government does, and this book is about it. I hope it sells millions of copies. Robert, why did you write the book and get to talk to us about the, the, how this book came to be? Yes, uh, this book, by the way, Andrew, and by the way, thank you so much for hosting me here. Um, this book for the average reader should be about the, the greatest humanitarian that you've never heard of. Um, uh, is, you know, a very famous person said to me, I must be dumb, Bob, because I've never heard of Bob Gersoni. And I said, that is exactly the point. It was too good a story to refuse to do. I had, no, I had met Bob 35 years ago in Khartoum, Sudan. And uh, during the, uh, the Great Ethiopian Famine, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the human uh, wave that came from Ethiopia into refugee camps in Sudan. And I had kept up with Bob over the decades. And, but I always assumed that because he was always working for the State Department or USAID or the UN, I assumed that he had gone to an Ivy League school and had a fairly conventional uh, background. Well, having dinner with him at the Cosmos Club in Washington, I asked him where you went to school. And then he said, well, I never graduated college. So that struck me. And I said, where'd you go to high school? And he said, well, I didn't graduate high school either. 
So, so I said, what did you do? He said, I went to Vietnam. And at that moment, it clicked that here was a very unusual personality. You know, a, you know, a great, you know, the background for a great story. A high school dropout, son of Holocaust refugees, uh, who had served in Vietnam and had been awarded a Bronze Star for service in Vietnam, and um, and who had spent forty years in conflict zones, um, uh, you know, in Uganda, Mozambique, Sudan, uh, in quite a number of places. In 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 Mozambique alone, he he saved. He was part of saving hundreds of thousands of lives because he stopped the war in its track that would have led to law, you know, to hundreds of thousands of people being killed. In Uganda, he exposed a mass murder north of Uganda, north of the capital of Kampala in the Luero Triangle. In Mozambique, while all of Washington assumed we were gonna arm the Renamo guerrillas as part of the Reagan doctrine, Bob Gersoni came back and was able to brief directly George Schultz and tell him that Renamo were a bunch of murderers and villains uh, with no real plan of governance. Um, and on and on it goes. He, he solved the problem of the Vietnamese boat people by, you know, by coming, up, coming up with the concept of an intelligence um, operation on the ground at the docks uh, where all the pirates told, you know, told stories about their exploits. Um, but think of Bob Gersoni as a character out of a Saul Bellow novel but who had spent his life in Joseph Conrad-like settings. Um, you know, that's what he exposed the illusion of knowledge where none actually exists. We think in this world of social media that we know everything that's going on everywhere because we can access it through Twitter or email or something. And Bob Gersoni proved that you don't really know what's going on until you're on the ground. And, and talking to people, you know, he was not prone to group think. He came back to Washington after each, at each foray, each adventure and exposed, exposed group think. He always exposed the wrongness of group think. He always found the truth, uh, whatever it was. He was a contractor, a mere contractor who had access to the highest policy makers because he gave the kinds of briefings that nobody else did. He employed anxious foresight. He was a constructive pessimist. He thought of the worst that could happen in a place so that the worst never did happen. He combined realism with idealism. He showed that human rights could go together with national interest. And he also worked at a time, the heart of his career was during this a, a golden age for the State Department. When neoconservatives got along with realists and others, yes, there were differences, but the differences were, were very muted, Andrew. He was one, Bob Gersoni was one man who made a difference, you know, and really show, really exemplified the American brand. And that's why I called the book, The Good American. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, summary of the book. Why did you write the book at this particular moment? I mean, is there some, is there some order to how you do these books? Uh, no, it was, it was really serendipity. I was working, I was in the midst of a book, a travel geopolitical book on the Adriatic Sea which would be similar to the book I published seven years ago on the South China Sea. And a, a mutual friend of Bob and I's uh, died. Um, his name was Jerry Weaver. He's a minor character in the book as it happens. And Bob and I decided to have dinner together. And that's when I found out about Bob's past that he never went to college, he never went to high school and it just, it just had a very deep effect on me. And I thought about it for a month or so. And then I asked Bob if, you know, if he'd be willing to cooperate with me on a book. Um, and he thought about it for a while and he said, yes. 
Uh, you know, Bob never sought publicity. You know, he never sought to be on television or anything like that. And, um, and so I started it when I did and I finished it when it did. It had no, there was no ulterior motive except, you know, everyone writes books about top people, top policy makers, about famous people. And it's, and this was a book about someone who's only well known within a certain, uh, within a certain professional subculture who I found more extraordinary and more interesting, frankly, than a lot of the big shots that I've met throughout my career. I think the, the other, the, the fascinating part of it, apart from the substance of what he was doing is how many times he came close to either getting killed or getting arrested. When I sent him up to the border with North Korea, as I said before we started, uh, to find out what was happening in North Korea, we sent him up uh, undercover with a with a, a Christian organization, and um, without mentioning the organization, and we didn't get official approval for, for this, obviously. And he interviewed, what did you say, 68, 86, 86 uh, people escaping North Korea, North Koreans. It was up in that number, yes. Right, and um, the the fact that he escaped. And he left his clothes in the room because the, the secret police were out to, to, to arrest him in China. I mean, he came very, very close to ending up in a Chinese prison camp, which would have been uh, a, an utter disaster. And, and you, you go through this in Colombia, you go through it in Mozambique and Uganda over and over again. Someone asked the question, uh, was there luck involved in Bob surviving all of these close calls or was did he have an inherent... Uh, sense about the place he was at and the risks he was at and an antennae that sort of tipped him off when he was really uh, close to getting uh, killed or arrested or, or, or uh, captured. Well, B Bob is not your typical hero. You know, he's not a swashbuckling, daring do, risk taking person. As I said, he's like someone like a very Neur uh, you know, neurotic character out of a Saul Bellow novel. And he was always worrying all the time in these Joseph Conrad-like settings. And so he had, he was ultra cautious, almost to a, 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 you know, to an obsessive degree. And yet this ultra caution uh, served him well because he never really had a life-threatening encounter throughout his career of, of, of four decades in, in, you know, in, in, in some of the worst disaster zones in the world. He didn't get himself killed. He, you know, he survived and he survived and he knew when to be a coward, as he said, you know, when to just pick up and leave. And, and Fred Cuny did not know that. Fred was, uh, you talk about Fred in the book, uh, and uh, it's certainly the case that Fred died in, in Chechnya in the mid-1990s. I remember Lyle Rosenblatt went out and looked for him for six months. Julia Taft, who was my predecessor at OFDA director, who later became president of Interaction and then secretary, assistant secretary said to the Refugee Bureau and State, called me one day when I was at World Vision and said, we need to go find Fred because he hasn't shown up in six months and, and we're afraid he's dead. And Lionel looked for six months and you and I need to go out. I said, Julia, you, can, you and I cannot go out. We've got other duties here. And of course we never found Fred's body, but he, he was more swashbuckling and took more risks. And uh, that's why I think he didn't survive, unfortunately. Yes, I write about Fred Cuny in the book. I write about three great people of the age industry, Bob, Fred Cuny, and Paul, and I think Paul Bell is his Paul name. Bell, yeah. Yeah, uh, and I describe Fred as the opposite of Bob, where Bob was cerebral and quiet and uh, was a listener and, and didn't attract attention. Certainly he did not attract attention of, or interest of the media. Whereas Fred was very um, Fred Cuny was who I met met once in Sudan. Also, um, was very was a real Texas character, with hand stitched boots, who flew, flew small planes, who was a raconteur, 
who you know who fascinated ju ju uh, journalists and who did uh, so much good. I mean, you know, Fred Cuny was really you know, his, his greatest hour was the um, was 1991 in the spring in the aftermath of the first Gulf War, where Fred Cuny and Jay Gardner, I believe you know, devised this way to keep the, you know, to support the Kurdish refugees, essentially. Um, so Fred Cuny did a lot of good, but, you know, and tremendous good, but he, he was just a different kind of a person than Bob. They were, they were opposites in a way, even though they both, um, they, you know, they both were famous in the humanitarian aid field. Actually, we, we got Fred's papers and we brought them to Texas A&M because he was briefly a student at Texas A&M. They're in the library archives here. I'm actually going to ask Bob if he would let us bring those papers here to the archives of the university, even though he has no connection with A&M because uh, they're so important historically. I, I don't think he'll do it, but I'd like to, I'm going to ask him. He's probably watching right now. Um, let me ask you something else. What drove him? Is it because his family... Uh, survived the Holocaust? What, what is the reason that he took these risks? He wasn't just for a job. You don't take those kind of risks for well, a job. Um, there's one, um, one of the people in my book, you know, I quoted as saying, Bob, Bob was very driven. He was very compulsive because he had a very towering, successful father who had done very, very well in business, lost a fortune, made a fortune back or some such. Um, and yet Bob had no credentials. He was in a world, a State Department and an AID world of people who had gone to fine liberal arts colleges, um, uh, you know, who, who in, in quite a few cases had postgraduate degrees and Bob had none of this. So there was this, you know, sense of li having, living up to his father, of feeling insecure, which made him that much more driven, that much more hardworking. You know, what one person after another told me in the course of researching this book was that Bob Gerson just wears you down. You know, you know, with deep, you know, um, you know, you know, he's unstoppable, you know, and, 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 and this was often very grueling work, grueling in an intellectual sense, as well as a physical sense, because often refugees, one after the other, after the other, for days on end, would all tell you the same story. And rather than be a bad thing, that was a good thing, because it corroborated evidence. Once you started hearing the same story from many people, you knew that it probably was true. And yet the act of doing it, of interviewing each person and making believe that you're finding this stuff out for the first time, you're acting enthusiastic, is incredibly tiring. You know, in a situation where there was, you know, not enough water to drink, it was hot, there was no air conditioning, often no electricity. It was a very grueling and yet a very extraordinary life. And that's absolutely true uh, uh, from the stories that he would tell. Uh, uh, it was not fun being in the field in many cases. And you bring out that in the book so well, uh, and time after time. Um, could I ask to, for you to describe the methodology that Bob used? Both Fred and Bob, Fred uh, Cuny and Bob, had uh, ways of doing, one thing Fred Cuny used to do is he would used to sit in the market with a translator in the middle of a crisis and just watch what was happening, who was talking to what, what were they were saying. Bob had a different methodology. Could you describe it, uh, Robert, because you know, he didn't write it down until you wrote this book, of course, uh, but it, there's huge lessons for the next generation of humanitarian workers, some of whom are listening right now to this conversation. What was that methodology that he used? Um, it, the methodology was based on the belief that the person he was sitting down with and interviewing, though a refugee, though uneducated, though half literate or illiterate, was nevertheless an expert at what he or she knew and had experienced. 
that just because you're not educated doesn't mean you don't have an accurate memory. Um, so he treated these people as equals or as people to look up to because they had an expertise that he didn't have. They were had an expertise about their experience, which he didn't know about. So he was learning from them, essentially. He asked them a, a whole number of questions, their age, their tribe, the area where they lived, um, you know, all to, but never asked for their names. And he made it clear to them he was not going to ask their names because he didn't want them to think that they could get in trouble or be identified. He also, ident what he did instead was he identified each person by a certain mark a way they talked, a piece of clothing that they wore. This was to preserve their individuality in his mind so that he would remember them as individuals, that they wouldn't just all disappear into some mass. Uh, you know, um, and, 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 and so starting with that, asking all these questions, but not their name, identifying them by a piece of clothing or something, he would then ask them, what did you go through? You know, what would tell me, tell me everything that happened. And when there was a silence between him and that person, which there often was, he did not fill the silence. He, st he stayed quiet. He let there be awkward moments so that they would fill the silence and tell them things. He tried never to ask them leading questions, like were the soldiers cruel to you? Because the, the, if you ask them leading questions, they may not tell the truth or they may not say anything. The truth will emerge provided you never asked, essentially. And often because he was talking through translators, he wanted to give them faith in the translation. So, so, um, so you know, he would say to them, um, what did you hear? And he would pull on his ear like this. Oh, what did you see? And he would lift his eyebrows like this. Um, you know, all these ways to put them at ease, to establish rapport, and, and to let them finish without ever interrupting them at all. It was more of a manner of interviewing. Bob Gersoni was a great listener, is a great listener. He also became a very, a, quite a good briefer as well. But most importantly, he was a good listener who knew how not to fill the silences. And you, you talk in the book about how each event that took place, each research project built his credibility up. And that at a certain point, when he come back to Washington, skeptics and people who would attack what he was saying would have there's a whole, whole bunch of people say no 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 if Gar Grissoni says this is happening it is happening and when I I think when I send him into Iraq to talk about the reconstruction program I knew when he came back he was not going to say nice things <laughs> but they listened to him I, we sent him around to all of the interagency process the CIA defense state the NSC and what was interesting to me is no one abused him and no one started yelling at him because his reputation preceded him when was the turning point in, in his career where people started listening instead of attacking him? Yes, Bob Gersoni was a private contractor. Because he was a private contractor, he was spiritually, spiritually a freelancer. And, and a freelancer is only as good as his last article or his last assignment, essentially. A freelancer has to prove him or herself over and over again. He succeeded in Uganda. He found out an atrocity was happening. Then he had to start all over again with the Vietnamese boat people in another part of the world and on and on. His breakthrough, his breakthrough mission which really established his reputation was Mozambique in 1988, essentially in the first half of Mozambique, because the Washington was gearing up, the Reagan administration was gearing up to supporting Renamo, the Renamo guerrillas against Free Limo, the you know the pro you know the pro-communist organization. 
And we, it, it, Washington was gearing up to support the Renamo guerrillas as part of the Reagan doctrine in the belief that Renamo was an analog to UNITA in Angola, that we were supporting UNITA in Angola, Joseph, Jonas Savimbi's uh, UNITA in Angola uh, against the Cubans. So now we would support Renamo uh, um, against uh, against Free Limo, that you know, you, Renamo and 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 Unita was similar, but Bob Gersoni exposed that. He said they they both may be anti-communist, but one is much much different from the other. And once he came, and he did this methodically. He interviewed hundreds of refugees. Um, in, in northern Mozambique, in southern Mozambique, in central and western Mozambique. Mozambique is a sprawling country. It's long on the map of the Indian Ocean in Southeast Africa. And it, you know, it goes along for 1,500 miles. And Bob flew all over the borderlands uh, in order to compile his evidence. And when he came back with this evidence, it was critical to the Reagan administration making the decision that Renamo would not be part of the Reagan doctrine. And, um, and that really made Bob Gersoni's career within, you know, within, the, uh, within the aid and State Department uh, um, subcultures because Bob was working for the Africa Bureau at the time. Uh, Se Assistant Secretary of State for Africa was Chester Crocker. And as, and as many people who are old enough know, the policy battles over Southern Africa in the 1980s were fierce. They were really fierce that Chester Crocker was hated by the left, by Ted Kennedy in the left, and he was hated on the right by Jesse Helms and others. He was truly friendless almost, but George Schultz believed in him and that was enough. And then Chester Crocker got an, a, you know, uh, you know, Chester Crocker got some real luck with Bob Gersoni's report about Renamo because it fit into his strategy of trying to wind down the Mozambique war, of trying to get the Cubans to withdraw by allowing Namibia to, which was Southwest Africa under apartheid, white South African control, allowing you know Southwest Africa to become independent M Namibia. Crocker had a whole, um, uh, you know, a whole um, geometric, you know, theory about about Southern Africa and how it would, how to how to fit the chess pieces together, and it would all eventually work out under Crocker and his successor Herman Hank Cohn. But they got a big stroke of luck with the Gersoni report in mid 1988. Let's see. One thing that you talk about is that the interaction between different elements of the humanitarian architecture, the response system. So for example, Gene Dewey was in during the Reagan administration uh, in the, the uh, refugee office at state, but then he went on to become the deputy high commissioner for refugees in Geneva, Switzerland, a UN agency. And so there would be, um, uh, AID or state would fund Bob to do something, but it would be all done through a UN agency. And so there was there were these relationships. I found that fascinating. I know it's true because we did a lot in AID, but it's not widely known uh, among people who hate the UN or love the UN. Could you describe that a little bit, this, this interconnection between the elements? Yes, and, and, during... and, and, and the most important element of this in the book is how Brian Atwood, the, the administrator of USAID in the mid 1990s, wanted Bob to do a project on Rwanda and Bob accepted. And then Atwood loaned Bob Gersoni to uh, Madame Sadako Ogata, who was the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And so Bob went out post genocide Rwanda working you know working for, for for the UNHCR wearing the flag of UNHCR but he had been loaned to UNHCR by USAID and Brian Atwood essentially 
So they USAID was paying Bob, but but Bob was uh, was kind of seconded to UN, UNHCR, and of course that resulted in probably Bob's most famous and controversial at the time. It's not controversial today. Report on how the new Tutsi regime was murdering tens of thousands of people. This was after the genocide against the, Tutsi, against the Tutsis. And so Bob came back with a complicating truth that nobody wanted to hear. Nobody wanted to hear, but, but Mrs. Ogata backed up Bob and, um, and Brian Atwood was full square behind Bob on this. And so there was this interrelationship. You know, one of the things that uh, about this book that I hope people take home is everyone reads books about high policymakers, about secretaries of state, national security advisors, presidents. But the, you know, what I tried to do here was to give a flavor, to give a sense of how things work in the middle level of bureaucracies, you know, at the, the middle, upper middle, because that's where it all happens. You know, the, you know that, and, and that's the, the level that Bob worked at, you know, working for assistant secretaries of state or any, and even lower deputy assistant secretaries. And, you know, this is a whole world of state USAID, which normally is known about only to people who work at those levels. A lot of the theories of international relations, the structural realists led by uh, Henry Kissinger and Mearsheimer and, and uh, other scholars, and then the liberal internationalists on the other side, create these, in my view, at least artificial views of why the international system operates the way it is without understanding that the people in the middle have an enormous amount of influence over their superiors and the information they get and the decisions they make. And I don't think I've ever read a book, Robert, that, that illustrates that more profoundly than this book, that in fact, these policymakers are not disconnected uh, if you have good field people with good reporting, that has a profound effect on what policy is, and it doesn't fit neatly into these, these artificial constructs that scholars have created about why countries behave the way they do. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, one of, the, one, one of the lessons of this book that I hope people take home with them is that, you know, great tragedies in policy can often be made by high decision makers who are missing one or two or three vital truths that any freelance journalist in the field would know. Um, and that what and Bob Gersoni exemplifies that, you know, ex exemplifies the fact that the truth is in the field in all the messy contradictory nuances and the, and the ground truth, the granular reality on the ground in any number of these countries defeats all isms, whether it's neoconservatism, idealism, realism, that as you said, Andrew, these are just big constructs, but the field is much messier. When you go to a place, you find that the reality doesn't fit one theory or another. Um, you know, there's a character in the book, um, Hilda Bambi Arayano, who is the US aid director in Ecuador uh, 21 years ago in 2000. And she commissioned Bob Gersoni to do his tour of Northern Ecuador to see how it would be affected by Plan Colombia. And one of the, and what she told me about what, what, what she found so liberating about Bob Gersoni was that Bob didn't say things like, oh, Northern Ecuador is like, uh, it's, you know, it, Northern Ecuador is like the problem I faced in this country or that country or another. Bob Gersoni knew that every place was unique, completely unique and required its own subtle fixing. And therefore he divided Northern Ecuador into three regions, North, Center, and, and, and West. And each region he developed a different strategy for. And all those regions were in turn different from what was going on over the border in Colombia. Bob was the ultimate granular you know, thinker. 
And, you know, it's the kind of person who can save high decision makers in Washington from making ghastly mistakes by giving them a sense of the reality on the ground. Let me, let's go back to a couple of the events to talk about the history of what happened. What, you didn't mention this in the book, you, you touched on it, but we, we now know that the Kagame regime the, that took over the, the first time in history probably that the people who were the victims of genocide took over a country and were in charge and then committed their own atrocities. But who caused the Rwandan genocide? Does Bob have a theory of that? What caused it? He must have had some understanding of what happened. Not really, Andrew. Here, I'm going to disappoint you. You know, Rwanda is the longest chapter in the book, but it deals completely with what happened in the weeks and months after the genocide. I go through the genocide with, you know, just telling because the genocide itself has been written about in so many books um, and has gone, been gone over and over by the media that I gave a, a description of it, a fairly detailed description, but that was not really the heart of the action in that chapter. The heart of the action was what was happening in the days, weeks, and months afterwards when the new regime, which, uh, which one must say, went on to, to, um, to very, uh, you know, to govern Rwanda, to develop it economically, to provide it with stability um, for many, many years, and was probably the only or the best alternative we, the international community had at that moment for putting Rwanda back together again. Nevertheless, it was that government that, you know, that murdered large numbers of people on, and one of the ways, one of the reasons why it stopped doing so was because the UN and the US government was able to bring pressure to bear on, on, on Paul Kagame to stop. And they were able to bring pressure to bear because they were holding the Gersoni report over his head. Very, very, very interesting. Let me go to the, uh, the uh, uh, Vietnamese boat people crisis in the South China Sea and the horrific conditions that these people were, were living through and uh, as they were escaping Vietnam. Can you talk a little bit about his strategy, which I thought was just fascinating. This is before my time. I didn't start in doing this work until 1989 when I became the director of OFDA. And by the way, the dark teams you keep talking about, they started during the Bush 41 administration. People don't remember that. That Julia Taft came up with the idea, but Bill Garbalink is the one who implemented under Bush 41, along with other people in OFDA. But you, so, so this is before my time. I don't have any rec personal recollection of it, but you said that Bob understood that if he made the bad guys, the ties look like they were the, responsible for this, that all you'd have is opposition and they'd, they'd hide the reality of what was happening instead of fixing it. And so he used some very interesting uh, uh, techniques to get the ties yes. to behave better. T describe that, because I thought it was fascinating. Yeah. I, at the beginning, Gene Dewey said to Bob, I need you to go out to Thailand because we've got this problem with Thai pirates who are, who are, you know, who are taking over boatloads of Vietnamese refugees. There were still Vietnamese refugees, even though this was almost a decade after the Vietnam War ended. You know, in any case, the Thai pirates were, were taking these boats, raping the woman, smashing the boats to bits, and, let, and for, forcing most people to drown on the high seas. And, and as a result, the, you know, we've given the Thais enough money for a Coast Guard cutter. You know, and next year we'll add a second Coast Guard cutter. And Bob Gersoni went out to, to, to Thailand and interviewed refugees in Southern Thailand. And Bob Gersoni presses his two hands against his head and says to himself, are they crazy? Do you know how large the Gulf of Thailand and the South China Sea is? One coat, you know, they're larger than the Great Lakes combined. One Coast Guard cutter, even two or three, is not going to be able to do anything. The solution to this problem is not at sea, it's on land. And that was his great revelation. 
go to the dockside bars where all these pirates come back from their murderous expeditions and listen to them and, and, and set up an intelligence network so you can convict these people. And don't go after the, uh, you know, and go after only the big ones, the worst perpetrators, you know, and arrest them. And that'll send a signal throughout the whole pirate uh, community. And Bob was able to work with DEA, the Drug, and, the Drug Enforcement Administration, to find someone. This person's name, he's in the book, is Terrell Tex Lyerly, who combined Peace Corps experience with DEA experience, who spoke fluent Thai, and who worked with the Thais, um, you know, establishing a network of operatives at these dockside bars, and they made quite a number of arrests. And to make a long story short, after a few years, the problem of Vietnamese boat people being, being you know, kidnapped, being taken over on the high seas by the Thai pirates was finished. It was over. Um, and, and another you, you know, and another exceptional part of this strategy was Bob came to the conclusion, stop blaming the Thais. Because for every Thai pirate who takes over a boat, there are 10 other, Thai, you know, Thai fishermen who rescue these people. So we're fo instead of focusing on the bad ties, let's focus on the good ties and let's work with the ties and give them the credit for the operation. So we, so we won't be beating up on Thailand all the time. And all these elements combined essentially solved the problem about two or three years later. And everyone was on You're, you're off, Bob, uh, Robert. Sorry, yes. uh, where should I pick up? Uh, after how, why the strategy succeeded. Yes, um, the strategy succeeded because we were able to work with the ties rather than, you know, uh, rather than blame them. And it succeeded <clears throat> because the, the problem was on land, not at sea. It was at land where these pirates would come back Tell the talk about their exploits at the dockside bars. And Bob came up with the idea of setting up an intelligence network at these bars to at these bars to arrest the perpetrators and to and to do it in coordination with the ties and to give the ties all the credit for the for, for the arrests. And this, you know, this problem, it was supported. This policy was implemented, it succeeded. After two or three years, the problem of Vietnamese boat people being attacked by Thai fishermen was ended. It was virtually ended. And Bob was able to get the quick support for this proposal from both the embassy in Thailand, the ambassador was John Gunther Dean, and the DCM was Chas Freeman, and also from the Assistant Secretary of State for Asia at the time, Paul Wolfowitz. So you had people with very different personalities, very different worldviews, all working together with Bob to solve this problem because Bob had come up with a creative solution. So uh, what are the lessons of your book for what is happening right now? Where America is turning in on itself. I mean, uh, right now, I, I just was talking to some people who are know what's going on in Tigray. Apparently, Isaiah Afewerki has sent 42 divisions of his army, the Eritrean, up from the Eritrean government, invaded Ethiopia. No one knows about it. They're in Tigray now, and they're slaughtering people village by village. They're stopping any food from going in, so people are starving to death. We actually need Bob Grassoni right now to go into Tigray. I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> go into Tigray and find out what's going on so the rest of the world can, can, can stop this outrage right now. It's a major crisis. None of the news media is reporting on it because none of them are there. We need Grissoni right now. What do we do to take the lessons from this book and apply them right now to the Foreign Service, to AID, and state in particular? The truth, Andrew, is all in reporting. 
what the State Department does, what USAID does, what they, what both of them do best is what old-fashioned print and typewriter journalists, foreign correspondents do, did best. Go out into the field and report objectively, ask a lot of people a lot of questions and come back and send cables or send news stories so that policymakers can be informed. Um, and this is what's been lacking. We, we, we live in this age because we read about something on Twitter or social media, we think we know what's going on on the ground. When in fact, what is going on in places like Tigray, the Eritrean Tigrayan border is more of a mystery than it's ever been because we suffer under this illusion of knowledge. So the lesson of this book, the lesson of Bob Gersoni's life is no matter how um, technological the world becomes, good old fashioned gumshoe reporting to explain to people in the capital cities what is going on in the far off hinterlands is more necessary now than ever. What advice would you give to young uh, foreign service officers and uh, young humanitarian aid workers, whether they're in the NGO community, the UN or AID or the State Department? Uh, I would say get out of the office and get into the field. Because we live in this world of email, everyone is besieged by email. Everyone is always at their desk answering emails in the embassies. You know, they're chained to the embassies. They're chained to the news bureaus or they're staring into their phone all the time. Get away from it all, ride buses, get into the field and talk to people, listen to people and find out what's going on. We need that now more than ever. Thank you. So, so let me ask you another question about um, uh, methodology. Uh, both Fred Cuny and, and Bob Grissoni focused on markets. And there are a lot of people who, you know, they don't like profit motives, they don't like markets, they think all business people are predatory, which is in my view, utter nonsense. But uh, they understood that markets were a natural element of human society. The question is, what role did markets play in the way in which Bob would analyze things and then come up with solutions? They played a great role. Because remember, Bob Gersoni had a different background than other humanitarian aid workers. Fred Cuny, for example, or Pierre Gassman, another humanitarian aid worker from Switzerland who's a character in the book, they all had their rite of passage moments in the Biafran War in the late 60s and in, uh, and in other humanitarian catastrophes. Bob Bersoni was a commodity trader. Like his father, he worked in the commodity uh, uh, business. He started a language school for profit in Guatemala after he got out of the service in Vietnam. Um, so Bob was Bob had the perfect background for dealing with these humanitarian issues because when you break it down, much of the issues, the challenges of the developing world revolve around agriculture and commodities. Um, and, uh, you know, Bob was once asked, what, what are the, who are the people he most respects? And he said, agronomists, because they understand about seeds and fertilizer and, and, and you know, and the things that peasants uh, understand. Because Bob had this background in the commodity trade he was able to understand many of the refugees who we interviewed and listened to and understand their issues. He always asked, what is the price of this? What is the price of that? What is the normal price you're expecting to get from it? He was able to go into Southern Colombia and Eastern Colombia and report back to AID in the embassy in Bogota why Plan Colombia was not working or why it was working because of questions he asked about crop substitution with the coca crop. Other aid workers wouldn't know this. They wouldn't be curious in this way because they didn't have, they wouldn't have had a background in the commodity trade like Bob Gersoni had. So that his, so that his business experience, even though he never intended it that way, had a profound effect on how he approached things and how he viewed the world. 
Exactly. But remember, Bob Gersoni did not study theory. He didn't have a theory on the world. He didn't get wrapped up in causes. You know, you know, there's a lot of people who get wrapped up in causes and signing petitions who want to solve this problem and that. Bob was a field worker. He was a field worker who knew a lot about agriculture, about commodities, and he just wanted to listen to hundreds of people he, in each place. He was not ambitious in the sense that he didn't want to be an assistant secretary of state or something like that. His ambition was to keep doing what he was doing, you know, to, uh, going out into the field throughout his life and listening to people. So I, I would just summarize that Theodore Roosevelt once said he considered every job he had to be the last job he'd have in the public sector. So he wouldn't make decisions because he was ambitious uh, for future jobs. And it seems to me woven through this whole thing was exactly what you just said, which is that Bob did not uh, try to personalize the or, or, or tell bad news to anyone. Um, uh, or avoid telling bad news to everyone because it would affect his career, his ambitions uh, to to take more senior positions, and and I, it seems to me that's part of the magic of how he approached all of this, that he didn't try to orchestrate his career. He just talked about in his reporting what was actually happening on the ground, separated from himself personally. Exactly. Bob was after the truth. As cliche as that sounds, as unoriginal as that sounds, he didn't think that if I say this, this is going to be bad for my career. Well, he did. I mean, when he when he had this news from Rwanda that the you know that the good guy, the so-called good guys, were now the perpetrators, he said, "Oh God, this is going to ruin my career. You know, nobody's going to be able to accept this." But he went ahead and he reported it anyway. You know, he didn't shade it in any way. He was true to the evidence he had gathered. And, you know, he wasn't thinking that if I report it this way, I may have a better chance to get this job or that job. There was, you know, it's said that character is what we are in the night when we're in bed alone thinking about what we're going to say and do the next morning. You know, that's where character really is. And Bob Gerstoni was always the truth teller. And I know this because one person after another who, who I interviewed told me that. So uh, let me go to Nepal briefly because bad things didn't happen, uh, even though we were afraid they would. I had made a trip to Nepal and because I had heard about the Maoists and I was a little worried that there was some con connection to the Khmer Rouge intellectually and that they, if they took power, there was gonna be uh, the killing fields. And I came back and you mentioned that a career officer in aid who became mission director later on, I think was a lawyer from Tennessee, is that right? Um, uh, John Williams, I think. Joe Williams, I think it was Joe, Joe Williams. Williams. Yes, excuse me. Well, and he said, we need Gersoni to come out here. Now, and it didn't occur to me when I was out there that we needed Gersoni, but Fred Sheck then called up uh, um, Bob and said, come in, Andrew wants you to go to Nepal. Because it wasn't just, I didn't know this, but other people were afraid. I, I get it from your book, but other people in the bureaucracy were all at the middle level were also very afraid what would happen to Nepal if the Maoists took over? The CIA was worried about it, state was worried about it, and there were people in the NSC. And so I have to say, you didn't put it in the book, but the embassy was not happy about his visit. They were upset. They said, we don't need you here. We, all, we have enough information. He, he interviewed, it's, I don't think you put it in your book, but he interviewed the, CIA, the, chief, the station chief of the CIA and said, you do know what's going on, don't you? And he said, well, we sent people and he said, when did you send them in? He said, well, someone went on a mountain climbing va vacation near the Maoist rebellion. That's the closest we've come to uh, trying to find out what's going on. And after he talked to them all, he reduced the tension and the hostility. I said, we're going to have to force this. And he said, no, no, Andrew, I'll handle this. His own, his own quiet way removed yeah. the impediments in the embassy. And the ambassador was supportive of it. But there were a lot of people who thought this was a threat to their own competence somehow to have Bob in there in the first place. And then they cooperated with him in a big way. Yeah, <clears throat> yes. Uh, Nepal was a very different, unusual assignment for Bob. 
because he was going there to answer a binary question. You sent him there to ask a binary question. Will the Maoists be like the Khmer Rouge if ever they get into power or won't they? You know, it was more or less that to get, and Bob was, and Bob traveled all around the Maoist area for weeks. He didn't go into where they actually were because he was terrified. You know, he was afraid that he would be killed or kidnapped or whatever. You know, it was Bob being like a, a very, uh, um, um, you know, very much a constructive, methodical coward as a way in order to survive. But he got close enough, a strategic, he was cowardly at strategic moments in order not to get himself into trouble is the way I should put it. But he got close enough and interviewed enough people and reconstructed their history as to what happened to them over the past few decades. So he came back with two things. He came back saying, no, these people won't be like the Khmer Rouge. They didn't have this totalizing philosophy. They couldn't, you know, institute what, you know, their desires in mass, so to speak. And that he turned out to be correct because the Maoists did come into government and the killing fields didn't happen at all or nothing even close. But he came back with something else. He came back with a beautiful, thick, report of hundreds of pages with maps, everything, explaining why the Maoist insurgency had taken root in the first place, what these peasants had gone through, how they, you know, their cash crop was hashish, and then hashish was, hashish was outlawed, so they couldn't grow their cash crop, and one thing after another happened, so it drove them into the arms of the Maoists. So, and I have this report on my desk right now. It's, it's brilliant, you know. Um, it's, uh, you know, Bob did a number of great reports. His most famous report that on Rwanda was not a great written product. It became famous because nobody could get their hands on it. But his great reports on Northern Uganda, on, on, Sama on, uh, um, uh, uh, on Nepal and, and other places are really, it, it's like a genre all its own. Yeah, just for historical clarification, uh, when he went up to the Chinese border with North Korea, by the way, I had been up there when I wrote my book on, on North Korea and the North Korean famine. I went up because when I went to North Korea with World Vision, I, I had translators from the foreign ministry translating and I knew they were lying about what people were saying. And so I said, I can't find out what's going in here other than just seeing things. So I went up to the border with a Buddhist monk friend of mine from South Korea who had an underground NGO there. And we interviewed people for three weeks. It was the basis for my book. And that's why I, we sent them up there is because I found extraordinary stories from people escaping North Korea about what the conditions were inside the country, the fact that people were still dying of, of um, starvation. The thing that was intriguing to me through this is Bob's politics, even though no one knew it, were right of center. And you said that a number of times, I'm not disclosing a secret now. And so I knew that. And he said to me once, he said, you know, Robert Kaplan and you and I have the same view of the world, which is realism, but we believe it has to be infused with ethics and with, with human rights. And that is unusual, I have to say, too many people on the right ignore human rights and and and, that I, I always, I've always found that troubling um, that that is the case. One of the things that because of Bob, Bob's worldview allowed him to see what was really happening is he didn't choose someone as a hero and then choose someone as a villain and, and, and then sort of try to prove one or the other. He, he said, well, no one is ever always a hero and no one is ever always a villain. Sometimes the victims become the, the, uh, the perpetrators of, as happened in Rwanda. So talk a little bit about how his worldview and his, his um, affected what he was hearing from the people he was interviewing. Yeah, Bob was, you know, nobody likes to be ca characterized, but Bob was center right. He was like a realist with a, a strong dose of idealism. He was practical. He was business oriented. He didn't get caught up in causes. Um, and that made him the perfect observer. 
He was in the middle, slightly to the right. He operated in a world of humanitarian workers who were on the left usually, and yet he managed to get along with them very good. I quote somebody from the CIA in the book saying, Bob was in the humanitarian community, but he was not of the humanitarian community. He was analytical. He didn't have any preconceived um, uh, um, preconceived notions, and that's why we at the CIA could trust his analysis. Um, and remember, Bob was so effective in government because people trusted his analysis. He wasn't, you know, he was not there advocating a human rights policy. He was instead saying, here are the human rights implications of policy option one, policy option two, policy option three. And people in high power liked that, you know? Um, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't giving them a lecture. He, yeah, he was briefing them, but he wasn't giving them a lecture, you know, from on high, so to speak. And what Bob saw was, um, you know, he saw the reality of the third world, of the developing world, I should say. And he saw how cruel and brutal it could be. But on the same notion, he always believed that you have to hold people to account. You can't just give up on a place. There, uh, in other words, he went to Northern Uganda. You know this, you, you're, you, uh, you're in the chapter. Uh, you were working for World Vision at the time. He went to Northern Uganda and this was um, 1996, 1997. And he was the first person to give a full body description from on the ground of the Lord's Resistance Army. The Lord's Resistance Army wouldn't become a, a social media sensation for another 13 years. Um, but, you know, Bob saw the Lord's Resistance Army rampaging through northern Uganda. He saw a Ugandan regime, which in the late 90s, uh, led by Uweri Museveni, which was not as bad as it is now, but was starting to get bad, so to speak. There were, there were a few good guys, but there were, you know, but Bob made distinctions and Bob didn't give up. Bob came back with a hundred page report on we can do this to help the region, we can do that to help the region. He never was world weary, in other words. He never gave up on a place. I'd like to just conclude with one uh, for you to relate this, this uh, fascinating story to me of how he shifted the, uh, the um, debate in the Reagan administration on Mozambique and on Renamo and Frelimo. Um, you said in it that when he came back and he was briefing George Shultz that Maureen Reagan was in the room. How did Maureen Reagan, President Reagan's daughter, get into the room? Do you, do you ever find that out? Well, did he write that somehow? Well, what happened was that Bob came back, Bob's immediate superior in this uh, Mozambique project was Jonathan Moore, the late Jonathan Moore who is at the time, you know, the head of the Refugee Bureau at State. Um, and, and, you know, Bob gave a full briefing to Jonathan Moore, and then Jonathan Moore arranged for him to give a slightly shorter briefing to Chester Crocker, the Assistant Secretary of Africa. And then Crocker and Moore arranged for Bob to brief George Schultz. And Bob went up to the Secretary's office and, um, and, and George Schultz appears with uh, a woman and, and, and George Schultz said, I'd like you gentlemen to meet Maureen Reagan. You know, she had been taken, taken an interest in humanitarian affairs in general and was very interested in this. So, um, and, and Chester Crocker had arranged for Bob to sit down facing Maureen Reagan and George Schultz and Crocker and Jonathan Moore would sit on the side at the edge. So that George Schultz and Maureen Reagan, I believe this was April, 1988. I can't, I'd have to go look in the book. Sometime in late March, April, 1988, they got the full Gersoni treatment. Gersoni briefed them for an hour you know, we, you know, bringing up the highlights of what these refugees had told him and what they had gone through. 
And, and another person who is very influential in this, in, in helping to get the Secretary of, of State Schultz's attention was Roy Stacey, who was a deputy in the Africa Bureau, along with Chas Freeman, under Chester Crocker. Um, they were all very uh, influential in this chain of events. And, um, and essentially it was, um, it was Bob Bersoni, Maureen Reagan, and Margaret Thatcher, by the way, who were the three influential figures who helped change President Reagan's mind on the Renamo guerrillas. Uh, in the same debate with Senator Helms, he gave, he gave me a lot of trouble on Angola. Um, but Senator Helms switched too, and you told a fascinating story about the use of um, the prayer breakfast movement, which is a network of evangelicals in the greater Washington area, very influential people who were close to Senator Helms. And why don't you describe how Bob influenced them to shift Senator Helms's mind? Yes, I, I believe it was Robert Hunter. I could be mistaken. Um, it's in the book accurately. Uh, had arranged for, uh, for Bob to give a briefing at a prayer breakfast and invited Bob. And Bob, as usual, showed up 30 minutes early because he was compulsive. He always came early. And they all filed in, all these people at the prayer breakfast, including uh, influential advisors to Senator Helms. And they held hands and they prayed. And then Bob gave his briefing about what, the, what these refugees in Mozambique had told him. And they were very moved by it. And it was they who went back to see Senator Helms. And it may have been one of the few times in Senator Helms's career when he, when he switched by 180 degrees his position on a very emotional, influential issue, the, you know, who to support and who not to support in the Reagan doctrine. I'm afraid we've run out of time, Robert, now, uh, but thank you for being with us and going over this. And I want everybody who's online with us to buy the book. And uh, we, we hope we can help you publicize it because it's a great book. I think a lot of people and career officers and aid and state um, are really pleased you wrote this because it, it puts AID and the State Department into clearer focus for the American people as to the great work they've done over many years in both among both parties, I might add, that this is not a partisan issue. Human rights is not a partisan issue. But thank you for doing it. And um, thank you for uh, being with us this evening. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.